Hello. Okay, so we are in The Taming of the Shrew. We are in Act 2, Scene 1, and we are right at the point where Petruchio has asked for Catherine's hand. Baptista says, I mean, if you get her love, then yes. And so he has a strategy. He's going to say the opposite of whatever she says. So he figures she's not going to be like she's not going to agree to anything because he's heard she's super disagreeable. So like he's going to do the opposite of whatever she says and does. And so he has this plan of attack. He's ready. This is battle. This is war. We have to see how this is going to go. This is my favorite conversation in this play. Okay, let's hear what happens once these two people meet. Good morrow, Kate. But well, that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard? But something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine that do talk of me. You lie in faith. For you are called plain Kate and bonny Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate. The prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall. My super dainty Kate. The dainties are all Kates. And therefore, Kate, take this of me. Kate of my consolation. Hearing thy mildness praised in every town. Thy virtue spoke of and thy beauty sounded. Yet not so deeply as to thee belongs. Myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. <laughs> okay. So the first thing she does, he's calling her Kate. He says, good morrow, Kate. So this is a nickname. Think about nicknames that you have. Think about who calls you by your nickname. So, so my name is Jennifer. Um, my friends call me Jenny. When somebody calls me Jennifer, it makes me think of like, you know, maybe my parents, like maybe I'm in trouble or they don't know me, right? Or it's kind of like a more respectful, but my friends, my buddies all call me Jenny, okay? Um, so people who are closer to me call me by that nickname and people who are farther away from me, not familiar with me, they would call me Jennifer or, you know, like, you know, some other respectful term like Mrs. Olson or something like that, okay? So he's referring to her with her nickname and she's like, I'm sorry, what? You may call me Catherine, because that is my official name. You don't get to call me Kate. I don't, I'm not a nickname person, Catherine. And then he says, no, you're wrong, for you are called plain Kate and Bonnie Kate, and sometimes Kate the Cursed, it's true, bummer. But you're the prettiest Kate in Christendom. Like he's giving her all these compliments. He's talking about her being da uh, dainty and bonny and pretty. And he says, um, you know, take this of me, Kate of my consolation, here in thy mildness praised in every town. He hasn't heard her mildness praised in every town. All he's heard is how terrible she is. He's lying. Hmm, but it's flattery. Sometimes that's cool. He says, thy virtue spoken of, thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs. Like they don't, they talk about your beauty, but not enough. You are beautiful, Kate. Myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first you were immovable. Why, what's immovable? A joint stool. Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee, for knowing thee to be but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Should be, should buzz. Well, ten, and like a buzzard. Oh, slow-winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee? I for a turtle as he takes a buzzard. Come, come, you wasp, if faith you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Aye, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you talk of tails. And so farewell. What, with my tongue and your tail? Nay, come again. <laughs> Good Kate, I am a gentleman. That I'll try. I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again. So may you lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman, and if no gentleman, why, then no arms. A herald, Kate. 
Oh, put me in that book. What is your crest? A coxcomb? A combless cox, so Kate will be my hand. No cock of mine, you crew too, like a craven. Nay, come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is. Then show it me. Had I a glass, I would. What? You mean my face? Well aimed at such a young one. Now, bye. Let's pause. Okay, so they are going super fast, okay? So, you know, you might have to kind of read through, look over to the side. Well, in, if you have the book, you have all of the explanation of all these different words um, that they use, okay? So there's a point where, you know, she says, she knew he was immovable. He's easily moved, easily swayed. And he says, what? Why? What's immovable? She says, a joint stool. So, you know, a stool is kind of put together poorly. And he says, there you go. You've hit it. I'm a stool. Come sit on me. <laughs> um, you know, that's interesting. Catherine says, asses are made to bear and so are you. So she's comparing him to a donkey and she's calling him an ass. Yes, that is hilarious. Please take that as it is. And he says, women are made to bear and so are you. So Women are made to bear children, um, you know, bear all sorts of things. Catherine says, no such jade as you, if you, if me, you mean, like I'm, you know, nah, -uh, that's not, I'm not, I'm, if you're talking about like bearing children, you know, bearing men being around, no, 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 none of that with you, buddy. And he says, alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee for knowing thee to be but young and light. She says, too light for one like you. Um, then they get into this wordplay with buzzing and being a wasp. Um, he says, come, come, you wasp, and faith, you are too angry. So she's a bit, she's a bit stingy with her words. She's a bit waspish. And she says, if I be waspish, beware my sting. You know, most men are afraid of her. Most men have run screaming from the room by now. Petruchio is not. He says, my remedy is to pluck out your sting. So how do you, how do you rid a wasp of their sting? You pluck it out. And she says, if a fool could find where it lies, so you don't know where my sting lies. And he says, who doesn't know where a wasp does wear a sting in his tail? This gets really rough, really fast, guys. I apologize. Shakespeare is coarse. Just think happy, young, innocent thoughts. Uh, he says a wasp sting is in his tail. She says in his tongue because her sharpness in her tongue is where everybody seems to leave her behind. Nobody wants to be with this woman. Nobody wants to be around this woman because her tongue is too sharp. She's too witty. Like her, um, and she's not putting up with anybody's stuff. Like, do you know those people who just will not put up with other people and what they say and what they do. Like there are some people who just don't have a whole lot of politeness. They just kind of t say it the way it is. And that's kind of how Catherine's always been. So she says her sting is in her tongue. He says, whose tongue? He's, he's starting to play with this idea. She says, yours, if you talk of tales and so farewell. And he says, what, with my tongue in your tail? which sounds a little off, Petruchio. And then he's like, ah, nay, just kidding. I'm a gentleman. I'm not saying bad things. And Catherine says, like she says, that I'll try. And she strikes him. She hits him. Now at this point, he turns around and he says, listen, I swear I'll cuff you if you strike me again. And she's like, if you strike me, you're no gentleman. And if no gentleman, why then no arms? You know, it's interesting. I think, I think this brings up kind of an interesting idea. She strikes him expecting that he can't strike her. And by social norms and rules, he can't, right? Like we know that a girl can kind of, kind of good-naturedly like hit a guy like, ha <laughs> ha. 
but a guy can't do that to a girl. Not really. Okay. A good naturedly sure, but you can't like actually use and and a girl could like like punch a guy and it's probably like she shouldn't. But probably for a lot of guys that wouldn't be something that would be like the worst thing ever because she doesn't have the power behind her like she doesn't have the strength behind her punch, right? But men aren't allowed to punch women. They're not allowed to strike women. And I'm not saying they should be. But if we're talking this idea of equality, it's hard to pick and choose whenever you want equality, what you want to accept and then what you don't want to accept. So I'm just saying there's a little bit of a double standard there that's interesting. So he says, listen, if you strike me again, I will strike back. And she's like, if you do that, you're not a gentleman. He's like, I didn't say I was. Like, I am a gentleman's son, but I have no problem hitting a woman <laughs> if, you're, if you're hitting me for no good reason. So that's kind of where Petruchio is at, man. He is just calling it as he sees it. He's not playing games. He's not playing a part. Um, and then she says... Uh, what is your crest? A coxcomb? Um, a coxcomb is a fool's cap. So she's mocking like he probably doesn't even have anything good on his crest. And he says a combless uh, cock. So Kate will be my hen. And she says no cock of mine. Of course we're using weird words here that are pretty funny. And can you take them in different contexts? Sure. Did they know those words and the different contexts back then in Shakespeare's era? For sure. So please understand, at this point in this dialogue between these two people, the groundlings in Shakespeare's Globe Theater are dying laughing. Like this is like, I mean, you know, hopefully they have popcorn, you know, they have some awesome things to like eat and drink. They're sitting back hooting and hollering. This is a great conversation between these two people that kind of seem to really not like each other very much. Let's continue. I said, George, I am too young for you. Yet you are with it. It is with care. I care not. Nay, here you, Kate, oh. suit you skate so. I chafe you if I tarry. Let me go. No, not a whit. Uh. I find you passing gentle. Tis told me you were rough and coy and uh. sullen. And now I find report a very liar. Uh. But thou art pleasant, handsome, passing curtain. Oh. But slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flower. Uh. Thou canst not frown. Thou canst not look askance. Uh. Nor bite the lip as angry wenches will. Nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk, but thou with mildness entertains thy wooers, with gentle conference, soft and affable. Why does the world report that Kate doth limp? Oh, slanderous world! Kate, like a hazel twig, is straight and slender, and as brown in hue as hazelnuts, and sweeter than the kernels. Oh, let me see thee walk. Thou dost not halt. Okay, so... We have a little bit of like a wrestle situation going on here. So first of all, she's called him old because he isn't like a young whippersnapper. He's probably 30 something. And she's told him he is withered, which that's not very nice, Kate. We shouldn't talk about people's ages. Anyway, he's not as old as Grimio, so eh. um, And then she says, uh, let me go. He's like caught her. And he's like, nope, definitely not doing it. And so she's trying desperately to like get out of his grip. Well, he's stronger than she is. So he just has a hold of her and isn't letting go. And while she's desperately trying to get free of him, he's saying, they told me you were rough, but that's a lie. You are pleasant, gamesome, passing courteous. Uh, slow to speech like he's literally probably like holding her and he's you know and she's like nah, nah, you know and she's like trying to get at him and trying to fight him and get away from him and all this time he's talking about he says um, he says your speech is like springtime flowers I mean he is crazy he's a little crazy you, you don't frown you don't look askance nor bite the lip as angry wenches will. She's very angry right now. She doesn't do that. She just never looks angry. Um, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross and talk, but you're mild. You entertain your wooers. You're gentle, soft, affable. 
None of these words describe Kate, okay? Catherine is in no way, shape, or form what he is describing right now. She is the opposite of that. He says, oh, slanderous world, world, you've slandered Kate. She's so wonderful. She's so sweet, so nice, so good. Um, oh, it's just sad, all the terrible things people have said about her. Go, fool! And who now keeps command? Did ever Diane so become a grove as Kate, this chamber with her princely gate? Oh, be thou Diane, and let her be Kate, and then let Kate be chaste, and Diane swore <gasps> for. Where did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore from my mother, which... A witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Yes, keep you warm. Marry, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. Ooh. And therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus, in plain terms... <laughs> Your father hath consented that you shall be my wife. Your dowry agreed upon, and will you, nil you, I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn, for by this light whereby I see thy beauty, thy beauty that doth make me like thee well, thou must be married to no man but me, for I am here and born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. Okay, let's pause for a second. So, so she's, um, you know, she's mad at him. He's, of course, held on to her this whole time. He starts talking about, did e'er Diane so become a grove as Kate, this chamber with her princely gate? He's comparing her to Diane. It's Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Um, so he's saying she's like a Greek goddess. And she says, where'd you learn all this goodly speech? You're saying all these really pretty words. Where'd you learn to talk all fancy and sweet like this? And he says, it comes from my mother, wit. And she says, a witty mother, witless else her son. So you're not witty, you're witless, is what she's saying to him. And he says, am I not wise? And she says, yes, that'll keep you warm. And he says, Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. So he'll be warm in her bed. He just said that, oh my gracious. And he's like, oh, this has been fun, but you know, let me just tell you straight up what's going on. Your father has consented that I can marry you. And I absolutely plan to do so. You will be my, my wife. Um, I will marry you. And he says, Kate, I am a husband for your turn. For by this light whereby I see thy beauty, and thy beauty that doth make me like thee well, thou must be married to no man but me. For I am he born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. So that's about the last thing he says before all of the other people walk back in to see how this whole wooing situation is going. Let's see what decisions are made. He does mention he's going to tame her. He's the only man who can. He thinks she's beautiful. He has said repeatedly every single terrible thing that she's done and said he has kind of said some pretty positive things. About the only thing he ever said what, that was not positive was at the point that she hit him, he was like, hit me again, I'm going to hit you back. That's about the only thing he said that was negative. Every other thing, he's talked about her great beauty, how wonderful she is, how, how, how much people have slandered her, that she's really just misunderstood, is how he seems to perceive her. The interesting thing is, has he perhaps in this situation figured out a little bit about exactly how she feels. Hmm. Here comes your father. Never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. Oh, Signor Petruccio. How speed you with my daughter? How but well, sir? How but well? It were impossible I should speed amiss. Why, how now, daughter Catherine, in your dumps? Call you me, daughter. Now I promise you. You have showed a tender fatherly regard to wish me wed to one half lunatic, a madcap ruffian and a swearing jack that thinks with oaths to face the matter and... Father, tis thus. Yourself and all the world that talked of her have talked amiss of her. If she be cursed, it is for policy, for she's not froward. 
but modest as the dove. She is not hot, but temperate as the morn. For patient, she will prove a second grizzle, and Roman Lucrece for her chastity. And to conclude, we have agreed so well together that upon Sunday is the wedding day. I'll see thee hanged on Sunday first! Ah, oh, but you shall. She says she'll see thee hanged first. Is this your speeding? Nay, then, good night, our part. Be patient, gentlemen. I choose her for myself. If she and I be pleased, what's that to you? It is bargain twixt us twain, being alone, that she shall still be cursed in company. I tell you, it is incredible to believe how much she loves me. Oh, oh the kindest, Kate, she hung about my neck and... Kiss on kiss she cried so fast, protesting oath on oath that in a twink she won me to her love. <sighs> oh, you are novices. Tis a world to see how tame, when men and women are alone, a meacock wretch can make the cursedest shrew. Give me thy hand, Kate. I will unto Venice to buy apparel against the wedding day. Provide the feast, father, and bid the guests. I will be sure my Catherine shall be fine. I know not what to say, but give me your hands. God send you joy, Petruccio. Tis a match. Amen, oh, say we. And we will be witnesses. Father and wife and gentlemen, adieu. I will to Venice. Sunday comes apace. We will have rings and things and fine array. And kiss me, Kate. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about this for just a second. So, so they come out, and he tells Baptista that yeah, she's absolutely going to marry me. And Baptista looks over his daughter. He's like, "Why do you look unhappy?" And she says, "Call you me daughter?" Um, she says, "Now I promise you, you have showed me a tender fatherly regard to wish me wed to one half lunatic. You're you said you consented to marry me to this crazy man." A madcap ruffian, a swearing jack that thinks with oaths to face the matter out. And then Petruchio's like, uh, yeah, by the way, um, we kind of came to this agreement, like, she loves me so much. But we decided that, like, whenever we're, like, all out in public and everything, like, she's always acted cursed and kind of, like, mean. And so she's just, just going to keep going with the way that she acts. But um, in private, you would not believe how much she loves me. It is a bit embarrassing how much she hung on me and hangs on my every word. And she just, she loves me so much. Like, wow, just really, it's crazy. He says, we're going to be married on Sunday. And she's like, I'll see thee hanged on Sunday. <laughs> and he's, he's. You know, he, he goes on. He says he's going to go to Venice. He's going to buy stuff for a wedding. He'll be back on Sunday. She'll be married. The thing is, he says that he's going to marry her within a week. And she doesn't deny it. So, like, at first she was like, Dad, you're going to marry me to a lunatic? But then... By the time he's reasoning out, like, why she's acting nice, or why she's acting crazy, but, you know, he says she acts, acts nice privately, she doesn't argue. She could have easily said, Dad, this is crazy. I hate him. I'm not marrying him. I refuse. This is terrible. You have to wonder if there's some part of her. First of all, this guy can keep up with her, with wit and his words. He doesn't seem to take the uh, shots that she shoots. Like other guys are scared and they run away. Not him, he's not scared. Matter of fact, he keeps talking about he's gonna tame her and stuff. Well, that's, you know, weird. You know, she's never met a guy yet who was brave enough to attempt even being near her. So this is entirely weird and interesting. And remember she was talking at the beginning of the scene about she didn't wanna have to dance barefoot at her sister's wedding. She didn't want to lead the apes in hell. She didn't want to be the queen of the old maids. So maybe this is the first guy who isn't scared of her. He's pretty funny. Like, he says a lot of hilarious stuff. He must not be a, you know, like, he, he's, he's reasonably okay. He's, he's got a good wit. You know, probably this is a situation where she's like, yeah, this might work. All right. So the scene ends, or well, his part of it, Petruchio leaves, and basically it's agreed on. Sunday next, the marriage is set. We will be 
married a Sunday. Was ever match clapped up so suddenly? Faith, gentlemen, now I play a merchant's part and venture madly on a desperate mart. Oh, it was a commodity lay fretting by you. It will bring you gain or perish on the seas. The gain I seek is quiet in the match. No doubt, but he hath got a quiet catch. But now, Baptista, to your younger daughter. Mm. Now is the day we long have looked for. I am your neighbour. And was suitor first. And I am one that loved Bianca more than words can witness or your thoughts can guess. Youngling, thou canst not love so dear as I. Greybeard, thy love doth free. But thine doth fry. Skipper, stand back. Tis age that nourisheth. But youth in ladies' eyes that flourisheth. Content you, gentlemen, I will compound this strife. Tis deeds must win the prize, and he of both that can assure my daughter greatest dower shall have Bianca's love. Say, Signor Gramio, what can you assure her? Okay, so now that the Petruchio Catherine situation is settled, Gramio and Tranio, who's standing in for Lucentio, remember, um, they want to know, like, who are you going to let marry Bianca Baptista? And Grimio and Tranio are getting into it a little bit. Um, Grimio says, Youngling, you youth, thou canst not love so dear as I. Tranio says, Greybeard, thy love doth freeze. You are old. She won't like you. Grimio says, But thine doth fry. Skipper, stand back. Tis age that nourisheth. So, you know, yes, he's old, but he can take care of her. Tranio says, but youth in ladies' eyes that flourisheth. Girls like a guy that's maybe not old enough to be their grandpa. He's not wrong. Baptista says, listen guys, it's adorable that you think I'm worrying about what Bianca wants, but actually what's going to decide this is who has the most money to put down. Hmm. All right. Well, as long as we keep remembering that marriage is about property and status, it is not about <laughs> love. All right. First, as you know, my house within the city is richly furnished with plate and gold, basins and ewers to lave her dainty hands, my hangings all of Tyrian tapestry. In ivory coffers I have stuffed my crowns, in cypress chests my Harris counterpoints. Costly apparel, tents and canopies, fine linen, turkey cushions bossed with pearl, valance of Venice gold in needlework, pewter and brass and all things that belongs to house or housekeeping. Mm. Then, at my farm, I have a hundred milk kind to the pail, six score fat oxen standing in my stalls, and all things answerable to this portion. Myself... I am struck in years, I must confess. And if I die tomorrow, this is hers. If whilst I live, she will be only mine. That only came well in. Sir, listen to me. I am my father's heir and only son. If I may have your daughter to my wife, I'll leave her houses, three or four as good, within rich pieces of walls as any one old Signor Gremio has in Padua. Oh. Besides, 2,000 ducats by the year of fruitful land, all which shall be her jointure. What? Have I pinched you, Signor Gremio? <laughs> 2,000 ducats by the year of land? My land amounts not to so much in all. That she shall have. Uh, uh, besides an argosy that now is lying in Marcellus Road. <laughs> what? Have I choked you with an argosy? Gremio, tis known my father hath no less than three great argosies, beside two galleasses and twelve tight galleys. These I will assure her, and twice as much what e'er thou offerest next. Oh, nay, I have offered all. I have no more. <laughs> And she can have no more uh, no. than all I have. If you like me, she shall have me and mine. 
Why, then the maid is mine from all the world by your firm promise. Gremio is out vied. I must confess your offer is the best, and let your father make her the assurance she is your own, else you must pardon me. If you should die before him, where's her dower? That is but a gavel. He is old, I young. Uh, may not young men die as well as old? Well, gentlemen, I am thus resolved. On Sunday next, you know, my daughter Catherine is to be married. Now, on the Sunday following, shall Bianca be bride to you, if you make this assurance, if not, to Signor Gremio. And so I take my leave and thank you both. Adieu, good neighbour. <laughs> I fear thee not, sirrah young gamester. Your father were a fool to give thee all, and in his waning age set foot under thy table. <laughs> Tut, a toy, an old Italian fox is not so kind, my boy. <laughs> a vengeance on your crafty wit of a lie. You have faced it with a card of ten. Tis in me head to do me master good. I see no reason, but suppose Lucentio must get a father called, suppose, Vincentio. <laughs> That's a wonder. Fathers commonly do get their children, but in this case of wooing, a child shall get a sire, if I fail not of me cunning. <laughs> okay, so that was a lot of talk about property. So basically, every time Gremio said, yeah, she's going to have a lot of stuff in this house, and Padua, Trania's like, I can give her a bunch of houses in Pisa. Then uh, Gremio's like, well, I've got a farm, I've got some land, and Trania's like, uh, she's going to have 2,000 ducats a year from the land that I own. And then Grimio is like, well, I have these two, uh, the, you know, three trading ships, these Argosies. And Tranio's like, yeah, my, fa my father, we have like several Argosies and we have uh, Galeasses. So uh, those are like uh, Galeans, which, so that's kind of um, better. And so basically there wasn't a thing that Grimio could say that Tranio couldn't outbid him on. So he has said, oh no, my dad, you know, I, I get everything, I'm the only kid, and my dad's rich. So ultimately, Tranio's like, looks like I win, and Baptista's like, yeah, I, I guess so. The only thing I need, I need to talk to your dad and make sure this is all as it should be. Like, I can't, I can't consent to all of this just with your word that you're getting all this stuff. What if your dad said that's not the case? So I need to talk to Vincentio, your father. So Tranio at the very end, he's like, well, since I'm fake Lucentio, guess I'll have to go find me a fake Vincentio. That's where we end act two.